our with our service providers from W. Ross McDonald School for the Blind and Resource Services, and certainly the Provincial Demonstration School. We have Christy and also Amy available with us. And thank goodness, Dan Giacomo. Majacomo is uh, sends uh, regrets, and that that's quite all right. Uh, we have Beth Conley Edwards, and we also have Amanda Polar. So what I'm going to do is um, hand the floor over to our team, and um, any questions that we have, please reserve them to the end of the presentation, and it just flows out that much more easily easily at the end of the day. Uh, FYI, um, the actual presentation will be made available on our Chiefs of Ontario website, and uh, we'll have that uh, that link posted to to everybody later. All right, thank you. Thanks very much for inviting us to present today. And Dan really does send his regrets. He hasn't been very well and uh, coughing a lot. So not, not the best for presenting, but he was very keen to be involved in this. So I know he was, um, he was missing the fact that he's not participating. Uh, I'm Beth Conley Edwards. I'm the coordinator of the um, Vision Resource Services and Outreach Program at the W. Ross McDonald school and I'm we're going to be sharing information today uh, that hopefully will help you to support students children and students and I'm Amanda Pollard I'm the educational quarter coordinator for deafblind resource services um, all right let's dig in so we'll start with uh, a land acknowledgement the land that surrounds us is part of who we are. It reflects our histories. We want to acknowledge that Brantford is situated on the Haldeman Tract, land promised to Six Nations, which includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. This is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and neutral peoples past and present. We wish to honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. This calls us to commit to continuing to learn how to be better stewards of the land that we inhabit. And Amanda, you added a nice picture there. Oh yeah. I wanted to point out that that is, that is a beautiful picture of the Grand River. And uh, we're, we're very close to the Grand River here um, at W. Ross McDonald. Uh, we often go out for walks at lunchtime and go down the hill and we can we can walk right down to one of the dams that's on the Grand River. So it's a it's a beautiful place that's enjoyed by a lot of people here in the city. So uh, we're just for today, we're going to be reviewing with you the um, programs that are available at W. Ross McDonald School for the Blind. Then Beth is going to go through the Vision Resource Services program and I'll be going through what we offer for DeafBlind Resource Services. And then if you have any questions at the end, we will do our best to answer them. So uh, Dan is Dan Majakmo, who is who has sent his regrets. He's the principal here at W. Ross McDonald School. We've included the website uh, in our PowerPoint. So if anyone is interested in exploring that later, they are more than welcome to. W. Ross McDonald School is a provincial resource center for students who are blind, low vision, and deaf blind. There are programs for lodging. There's full academic courses where the Ontario curriculum is offered. We also have specialized programs and then our resource services programs. We work with district school boards, local agencies, universities, and colleges to provide a wide range of services um, for the students in the province. Amanda, one thing I'm just gonna mention there that, that we didn't uh, actually say is that some of our students are also day students. So yes. although we do have a lodging um, program for probably 75 to 80% of our students, um, if they're within about an hour of the school, we also have students who come here on a on a daily basis on a on a bus or taxi, just the way that they would to any other school. That's right. Uh, so just a little history of the school. Uh, we've been around for about 150 years. We just celebrated uh, that last year. 
So it was originally called the Ontario School for the Blind, where there was only 11 students enrolled. Um, and then in 1972, the name was changed to W. Ross McDonald School. Uh, and in 1983, Resource Services was created. So uh, students that attend W. Ross, they used to come from all over the province, or sorry, all over the country. They came from BC and, and out Nova Scotia way. But now it, the students that attend here are only from Ontario, the province of Ontario. So the school offers a unique educational community. The students vary in age from four to 21 years of age. I think Dan was saying this year, it's the first time they've had a kindergarten class in a number of years. So that's really exciting. Uh, as we mentioned, there's both day and lodging opportunities for the students, depending on where they live. Uh, and then we provide instruction for the Ontario curriculum and then something called the expanded core curriculum, uh, this, which meets the needs of students who are blind, low vision and deaf blind. It's a specific curriculum that helps them learn skills um, that require direct instruction. So it's things like social skills, recreation and leisure, sensory efficiency, compensatory skills technology skills. A big one here is orientation and mobility. So being able to navigate your environment and travel safely, self-determination skills, career skills, and independent living skills. And one of the uh, compensatory skills oh, would yes. be braille instruction. For instance, if a student um, could not access print materials, then a compensatory strategy would be to use braille. So that's another big part of our programming here is that we have um, qualified teachers of the blind who can teach Braille. Yeah. So some of the really special things about uh, W. Ross is again, that we have that orientation mobility programming uh, with specialty in, like instructors who are specially trained in um, O&M. We also have um, independent living skills program where there's actual instructor instructors who teach the students, um, you know, cooking skills and dressing skills, hygiene, um, you know, how to live uh, independently. Uh, we do have uh, some lodging programs where the students are very independent and learning to live in an apartment on their own. Um, we, the Braille and technology instruction, we have wonderful, a wonderful music program and music therapy. Uh, dramatic arts where the kids put on plays. We have work experience programs where the kids are going out into the community and having jobs and specialized training. We have specialized physical education and outdoor education where the kids learn they're actually participating within um, like a physical education program. Uh, we do transition to post-secondary and community. There's lots of short-term programs and transition programs that are all listed here and Beth is gonna explain them. Uh, and then we also have uh, ARO, which is the Alternative Education Resources Ontario, where they produce all the braille and large print for schools in the province. It might just be worth noting too, just for um, interest sake, that ARO also provides materials for any student who has any kind of print disability. So that might also include someone who has a learning disability, for instance, who might not be able to access um, print materials, but needs auditory materials to support their learning. So they would also get that through Arrow. So it's quite, quite well known across the province as an amazing resource for schools. So as Amanda said, uh, we have some really unique um, and awesome programs for students to participate in as well as being able to come here and attend as a student full-time. So that is an option that students can come here and attend as a student full-time like they would in a district school board, but this would be their school. Um, but we also recognize that in some cases, you know, maybe families uh, don't want their, their student, their child to be here all the time and they would rather um, have them be in their home school. And, and yet they want to take advantage of some of the opportunities that are here for working on those expanded core curriculum areas that Amanda was talking about. Um, so some of the, the programs are listed here. Um, I'm actually gonna start sort of 
backwards, but I'm going to talk about the Connections program. So the Connections program is for students who are in grades six to eight. And these are students who would be attending um, in their own school somewhere in the province. And they're able to come to W. Ross uh, for a week at a time, um, once a, one week per month, approximately. So it actually works out to being six to seven full weeks spaced throughout the school year because we don't um, have them come in March because of March break and we don't have them come in December because of Christmas. But it gives them an opportunity to come to the school here for a full week uh, where they're supported by specialist teachers of the blind and qualified instructors of orientation and mobility, uh, independent living skills. We have a, a dedicated braille instructor here. Um, technology support uh, is provided, as Amanda said, amazing music and phys ed program. And all of this is done in collaboration with the student's home school. And if there is a teacher of the blind in that board, then uh, we again are collaborating with them. So the idea is that we're still going to support whatever would have been happening in their school board during that week that they come to attend at W. Ross so that they don't go back and feel like they're behind in, um, you know, in their own studies. So they're able to work on some of those academics here, but at the same time, they're able to be pulled out to participate in some very specific instruction around those uh, expanded core curriculum areas. We also, during the time that they're here, offer assessments, uh, which can be really critical and sometimes not an easy thing to get in a district school board. Uh, sometimes the people who do assessments in a district school board might not be really familiar with working with students who have vision loss. So uh, when they're here at the school, they can get assessments in literacy, numeracy, oral comprehension, in their orientation and mobility skills, their independent living skills, in their braille, their braille development and in technology. So we're really working to support them in literacy, numeracy, and of course that expanded core curriculum. And this is a very popular program. We have lots of students participating from across Ontario. And again, depending on where they live, some of uh, the students might come for the week and just uh, be here for the school day. And they may go back to their own home to sleep at night if they're close enough. But we also offer lodging for the students who are coming from a distance and they usually come in on a Sunday night um, and then they stay here until Friday at noon. That's the way that our school works um, for any student who is going to our school, even if they are attending uh, on a regular full time basis. Our school day ends at noon on a Friday so that all of our students can travel and get back to their home community at approximately the same time that other students would be getting home from school. So our day is just slightly longer throughout the rest of the week to allow for that opportunity for them to get home on a Friday afternoon. Hmm. And then we have the Bridges program. Uh, the Bridges program is for students who are either blind <laughs> or low vision. Huh. And for people who are planning on attending post-secondary, so college or university, the following calendar year. So this is a one-year program. It's very flexible and highly individualized. Uh, it's a pathway program to support that positive transition from, from secondary school into post-secondary, which we all know that's a big transition for all students, but particularly for our student population, that can be a very... Um, challenging transition. And so that bridges program is exactly what it was named for. It's a bridge from secondary school into post-secondary, and it's designed to help students develop those independent living skills that they're going to need to have to be successful at post-secondary. And of course, as it says on our screen and in life, they need these skills to be successful. So even if they're, you know, strongly academic students who might be ready to go to post-secondary for their academics, they may not be ready in other ways. They may not have those independent living skills established that they need to go. And this program gives that support. So some of the really awesome opportunities of the Bridges program include um, courses to complete their OSSD, um, dual credit courses that we um, do through Conestoga and Mohawk College which have been extremely supportive and really awesome experiences for our students to be able to experience college life. 
Uh, they can do interdisciplinary studies courses, co-op, uh, so they get some work experience. They get wonderful guidance support here from our guidance counselor, uh, helping them uh, plan their pathway for beyond secondary school. They get the orientation and mobility skills, independent living, and they live in on-campus housing where there is supervision. Um, and so the living is very safe, but they're encouraged to be as independent as possible, but supported sort of scaffolding those skills so that they're ready to go out on their own when they go to post-secondary. And then we have the junction program. Uh, it's similar in, to bridges in the sense that it is a, a bridge between um, secondary and beyond, but it's for certificate and workplace diploma students. So these would be students who are not going to complete an, um, their Ontario school secondary diploma necessarily, but they're getting a certificate or a workplace diploma. And again, it's a very individualized program that supports students as they're preparing for whatever they're going to do uh, after high school. And that might be um, going into a work placement. It might be going into a very specific college program. There are um, excellent college work initiative programs that students can apply for and attend. Um, and again, just helping them with those independent living skills. So if they're going you know, to work in the community or volunteer in the community, uh, they are going to build those skills. So that's the junction program. And then the high five initiative is for students who are deaf blind, blind or low vision. It's ages 18 to 21. And again, this is for students who are preparing to transition from school to adult life. So the goal is to provide an experiential curriculum uh, that's going to meet some of those very specific needs of those diverse learners and some of the opportunities that they would get in that program. Lots of wonderful music opportunities, physical education opportunities to, to learn those skills so that they can take those forward and, and maintain a healthy lifestyle once they leave school. Work experience again, for especially for some of those students who may be able to uh, get employment when they leave secondary school. And it offers total communication for our students who are deaf blind, which I'll maybe let Amanda speak to that in a minute, but it also, um, again, just gives them that nice opportunity to be part of campus life, to be around others, to build social skills, and to feel like they're part of a community. Mm -hmm. And then we have one other program called Kinder Connections that's not up here. Um, it's just a one day program. And as, as the name would indicate, it's for our little people. They actually don't have to just be in kindergarten though, if they didn't attend the program when they were in kindergarten and if they're in grade one or two, they're still welcome to come to our Kinder Connections program. It's a one day program this year, it's offered at the end of May and uh, they come here with their parents. They get an opportunity to see the school and to experience the parents get some um, in-service, some information uh, shared with them. And it also gives parents a chance to connect with one another. And then there's programming for the students as well. And it's been a really nice successful program to bring some of those families together who otherwise maybe would not even know about one another, but they come here and they can connect and share you know, some of their uh, similar challenges and joys. So I'm just gonna go back quickly to the total communication from the High Five Initiative and let Amanda just explain exactly what we mean by total communication. So total communication is a specific approach that's used with students who are deaf blind. Um, and it's very complicated. Um, I'm actually gonna show you, like it's not a very good picture, but because it's not in color, but I don't know if you can see it very well, but it basically takes all different aspects of communication and then the strategies that we use to like just support students who are deafblind. So if they're commun like every individual who's deafblind, they have different ways of communicating based off of their vision and their hearing. So we look at the total communication approach and we're like, okay, do they need braille? Do they need sign language? Do they need... Um, you know, pictures or photographs, do they need concrete cues? And we come up with like the approach for communication so that they can receptively um, access uh, language uh, and communication, but also that they can expressively, um, you know, communicate that they can express what they want, their wants and desires. 
Thanks, Amanda. So the admissions to the W. Ross McDonald School, um, we have an admissions process. So there's a package that is filled out and reviewed by an admissions team. Uh, and we look at basically what we're looking at is whether the student will benefit from the unique programs that are offered here at W. Ross McDonald School. So we offer a very unique style of instruction in a very specialized setting with very specialized teachers. So we want to make sure that any student who is um, wishing to attend here is gonna benefit from those programs, which obviously they would need to have a vision condition of some sort or uh, a deaf blind um, diagnosis of some sort to be able to come here. But we definitely look beyond that because we want to make sure that they're going to benefit from um, everything that is offered. So if there are ever questions about admissions, we have an admissions coordinator, Emily Hyde. Her phone number and extension are in the PowerPoint that we will share. So if anybody ever has questions about that, you can contact her. Um, usually we like to make sure that students get an opportunity to come and visit the school. Um, sometimes we might have them come for a trial period here at the school before they're admitted. And it's not the, the right setting for everyone. So we just wanna make sure that they're a really good fit. We wanna make sure that the student wants to be here as well. So that student voice is really important when we're looking at admissions here as well. It is a very flexible um, kind of admission process though. We've had lots of students who've started off in their own school board, in their district school board or wherever they're attending. And then they've decided that they wanna to come to W. Ross because they wanna take advantage of those expanded core curriculum opportunities, or maybe they're struggling socially. Maybe they are not, you know, having a very um, enjoyable, joyful time in their own school, and they really would benefit from an opportunity to come and be with other students who have some similar challenges that they can connect with. And then on the other hand, sometimes we have students who start here at W. Ross, they gain a lot of those skills, and they might go back out into their um, home community school. So it's a very flexible approach. We've even had students come, go back to their school, then come back to W. Ross. Uh, it is a very, very flexible um, approach, which I think makes it work for the student and their individual needs. So I'm going to now speak to you. So everything that Amanda and I just spoke to you about was really the part that Dan would have shared, because Dan is the principal of the school, as well as Vision Resource Services and DeafBlind Resource Services. So everything we just shared, that's about the school itself. And if a student chooses to attend the school or they choose to participate in one of those unique programs that I talked about, um, those are all options for parents. One thing we didn't mention is that that's all free of free of cost. So all of that is paid for by the Ministry of Education, including the transportation for students and all of the food and everything that students would um, be consuming while they're here at the school. Um, that is covered by the Ministry of Education. So it's at no cost to the parent in the same way that attending um, a district school board or another school would not have a cost unless you're attending a private school. Of course, there might be a cost. So now I'm gonna to speak to the part um, that is my department. So the Vision Resource Services and Outreach Programs Department. I'm the coordinator of that. So my contact information is on this slide and my phone number and extension. And Amanda has kindly put um, a link there to our referral form. So if you, for instance, had a student um, that you thought would benefit from an assessment from our department, you can click on that and it will bring up the referral form. I'll speak to that a little bit more as I talk about um, our services. So our department, um, it is here at the site of the W. Ross McDonald School, but we're in a separate building. And um, as Amanda mentioned, this uh, came about as a result of a bill that was passed in 1982 to ensure that students across the province were receiving uh, the kinds of supports that they um, deserve. And we definitely feel that that's what our department is doing is, is providing equity to students across the province. So we offer outreach programs to not only district school boards, but to private schools and schools um, for students who are First Nations, Métis and Inuit across Ontario. There is a small fee for service 
for private schools, but not for schools for First Nations, Métis and Inuit across the province. Um, this is all administered through the Provincial and Demonstration Schools Branch or PDSB, and it's the Student Support and Field Services Division, all under the umbrella of the Ministry of Education. So here in my department, we have nine consultants. They all have their specialist teacher of the blind qualifications, which are qualifications that they would receive beyond going to teacher's college. They would uh, have to complete a three-part um, qualification program in order to have that, um, that name of specialist teacher of the blind. And yeah, we'll go to the next slide. So we support students who have no functional vision at all. So that could be um, a student who's completely blind or they might just have light perception. This would be including uh, students who are using braille as their learning media. We also support students who are legally blind. And the definition of legal blindness is that you have 20 over 200 acuity in your better eye after correction. So this is, there's lots of us who are maybe wearing glasses who if we didn't have glasses on, we would be uh, considered legally blind, but with correction, you are much better than that. We're talking about people that with their correction still are 20 over 200 um, in their better eye after that correction, or they may have a very significant field of vision loss. So that's why it says they're a visual field loss of, of sorry, a visual field of 20 degrees or less. So imagine just sort of think about tunnel vision. If um, the acuity within the tunnel might be very good, maybe they have quite accurate um, acuity in that tunnel, but they are missing a lot of information because of that field loss. So they're also considered legally blind. And we also support students who have low vision and that would be 20 over 70 acuity in the better eye after best possible correction. And we also support students who experience difficulty with accessing the Ontario curriculum due to a visual condition. And this could include a cortical visual impairment, which we see many, many students with this diagnosis, which is more of a processing visual condition. So it isn't ocular or related to the eye itself, but it's more at the brain level that there is a processing issue with the information that's coming from the eyes. So you can see we have a very um, wide range of students who we work with. They have many different eye conditions and visual abilities. And many of our students also have other exceptionalities, which could include physical or cognitive or behavioral uh, exceptionalities as well. So it, vision is, it's not always in a silo. There's often other things that are happening for that student, but we're going to go out to try to support from the perspective of the vision and how we can make sure that things are as accessible as possible for those students. So our role is to, we go out in person to see students. We perform functional vision assessments, um, basically seeing how do they use their vision in functional situations. That might look very different than what it looks like on a medical report from a doctor. What does it look like when they're in their classroom setting or in their preschool setting? What does that look like and how are they using their vision? And we support learning media assessments, which means that we helped um, people to determine, are, is this a student who Braille is going to be a beneficial medium for? Or is this a student who large print will be the medium? Or are they going to be a combination learner? Maybe they're going to use Braille and audio materials. Maybe they're going to use print and audio materials. So that's what a learning media assessment looks like. We provide uh, recommendations for programming within uh, the classroom that they are in. And we also uh, provide a comprehensive written report. And a lot of people use those written reports to help do their planning and to help determine goals for the individual education plans for students. And another role of ours is to look at the needs for technology. So does this student need specialized adaptive equipment uh, to be able to access the curriculum? Or do, can they, do they need mainstream equipment using accessibility features on that mainstream equipment to try to access the Ontario curriculum? And that is done through something called the Special Equipment Amount or SIA. 
So students who are eligible for that within a school board, um, the school board can pay a small deductible and then the Ministry of Education pays the, the bulk of the cost for that equipment for a student. So our role is to go out and provide a letter of support for those special equipment amount um, pieces of technology that we deem to be necessary for that student to access the equipment. And we, we support the whole school team. So some boards have a full team of vision itinerant teachers. Other boards might not have a vision teacher at all. Um, so in those cases, we might be supporting the CERT or the special education resource teacher. There's a lot of acronyms in Ontario education. So in some boards that might be called alert, a learning resource teacher or an LST, a learning support teacher or just a resource teacher, they're all that specialized teacher who's helping students who have exceptionalities in the school. We support educational assistants who are, you know, the backbone of a lot of the support for our students and other professionals who might work with um, that student. So an example might be a speech and language consultant or augmentative communication uh, person who is helping to determine equipment as well for communication purposes. We also provide, um, an assessment for the need for orientation and mobility. So we don't provide that actual orientation and mobility instruction because that's done by a qualified orientation and mobility instructor, but we would see whether that student, do they need that? Do they need that for safe travel? And if they do, we would let you know that so that you could then um, make sure that they get that specialized instruction. We also have a special um, program, preschool program, for supporting early childhood vision consultants. So early childhood vision consultants often work with children from birth on, and that's through a different ministry. It's not Ministry of Education, it's Ministry of Child and Youth Services, but they work with those students, or those little people when they're born and support the families. But once those students start into school, uh, the ECVCs, the early childhood vision consultants are no longer involved. So we have a preschool program where we support that ECVC and from four of those children, if they're two years of age and older, and this is for children who we are wondering whether they will be potential Braille users. So there's never, you know, at two years old, we're not going to say, no, they're never going to be a Braille user, but we can definitely look at a student and say, potentially, they may require Braille based on what their vision uh, functional vision use is. So we would then support that ECVC while they're working with that little person until they start school to work on those skills that they're going to need to possibly be a Braille user when they get to school so that they are ready when they get to school to start working on literacy and, and numeracy like all the other students. We also support um, school staff and families to help students transition. So that might be transitioning into school. We help any child, they don't have to be a potential Braille user for that. We will help with any transition to school for a child who's blind or low vision. And that could look like transitions from uh, elementary into high school, a very big transition for all students, a different kind of situation when you get to high school and there's not one teacher who's really responsible for that student. And you know, there's a variety of teachers that they're going to. So that's a big transition that we support with. And then of course, transition from high school into college, university, community programs, and whatever that student ends up wanting to do as part of their pathway. And then we do things like this. We provide workshops and we also provide demonstrations. As an example, um, if we recommended a certain piece of equipment, we might do a demonstration for a team to show them how we think that should be implemented with the student to try to support them in the use of that equipment. And then Amanda briefly mentioned earlier about um, short-term programs. So the short-term programs are were developed with the school and with Vision Resource together. So it's sort of a joint project. We offer these programs uh, to Ontario students and their families on select weekends throughout the school year. And the, the whole goal is to have those students come to be part of a program where everything's already been designed to support the needs of, of a student who's blind or low vision. So everything's accessible to them. 
and they can come here to develop, you know, social relationships with peers, which it's always so important that students with vision loss get to be with other students with vision loss so that they can share their challenges and realize that they're not alone. Because in some cases, students can feel really isolated. Uh, we are a pretty niche population of students. So in a school, they might be the only student who has blindness or low vision, and they may feel like they're very, very alone. So the short-term programs give them that opportunity to maybe potentially make new friends in a very safe and enjoyable environment. And they're usually a themed weekend. So some of the themes have included things like creative arts, cooking, music. They do an outdoor education um, weekend where they go camping. They've done a prom weekend. So some of them are very specific to specific age groups, depending on what the program is. But Lucas Newhouse is the uh, coordinator of the program. His contact is here as well. And he is great and would be happy to provide you with a list of all the programs that are happening in any given year. And um, the the flyer will explain what age groups are being focused on for that particular weekend. And then um, you can contact Lucas if you're interested in a student coming to attend. There's also usually one weekend in the year where they do um, a parent student weekend. So the parents come with the child and there's programming for the parents and there's programming for the families. Um, and I see a question in the chat there. The short-term program has zero cost. They try very, very hard to make the travel also uh, no cost because I'll give you an example. Uh, we have students coming from all over Ontario to the school uh, during the week to attend here at the school. So if there's students here, let's say from Thunder Bay, they are going home on a Friday. So the plane takes them back to Thunder Bay. And if some students who go to school in Thunder Bay wish to come here for the short-term program weekend, they come back to W. Ross on that same plane for the weekend and then vice versa at the end of the weekend, those students would go back to Thunder Bay and we pick up the students to come back for the week who attend here. So they do really go well above and beyond to try to reduce or eliminate costs for travel for short-term programs and that's all done through Lucas and honestly he goes above and beyond he has driven to um, pick people up at train stations we've done lots of things to try to make it work and often if there's you know other vision teachers or um, family in the area or something we usually can make it work so it's it's been very successful that way great question though So I think that's it for, for my particular program, but if you have other questions, when Amanda's finished, we're gonna open up the floor for questions. So um, as I said earlier, I'm the educational coordinator for the deafblind resource services and outreach programs. Again, my contact information, email, phone number are on the slide, as well as uh, our referral, a link to our referral form. Uh, so, our services are similar to Beth's in the sense that like we're, we also offer uh, support to students who are deafblind in preschools, district school boards, private schools, and schools for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit across Ontario. Now, the big difference is that we're ongoing support, whereas Beth's pr program is like kind of they go out once. Um, or a couple times if it's preschool, I believe, and then uh, that's it. Whereas we are providing ongoing support. Um, you know, every most students, it's about every six to eight weeks, uh, and then depending on uh, the needs of the student. Uh, but we, and that continues, like, basically we support zero students who are zero babies um, all the way to 21. We're also located... Um, at W. Ross McDonald School. In our department, we have six educational consultants and we all have different qualifications. So some of us are specialist teachers of the deaf blind, uh, some are specialist teachers of the blind or specialist teachers of deaf hard of hearing. And we're all working towards that specialist teacher of the deaf blind. Uh, we support about 130 students throughout the province. We actually have a consultant up in Fort Francis this week 
Uh, we go as far east as Ottawa. Um, but yeah, we support for the whole province. So just to give you an, a little bit of a glimpse about um, what deaf blindness is. So we don't like we do have a little bit of a criteria that we look for, but we really try to focus on the functioning aspect. So deaf blindness, it combines the loss of vision and hearing to varying degrees, uh, which results in severe difficulty accessing information, learning, communicating, and participating. So we have students who might be um, total vision loss, total hearing loss. Uh, or students who have a little bit of both, uh, or ones who have no vision and a little bit of hearing, or no hearing and a little bit of vision. So it's very, like, the it's so varied. No one student is the same. Uh, and then these individuals who are deafblind, they're unable to use one of their distance senses to fully compensate for the loss of the other. Um, so neither of them can be their primary means of learning. They have unique and complex needs and require services and support that are different from those designed exclusively for someone who's blind, low vision, or someone who's deaf, hard of hearing, or someone that has multiple exceptionalities. So when both vision and hearing challenges exist, the attention and consideration need to be given to both senses simultaneously. So there's this like compounding impact to their entire day. Uh, so adaptations, accommodations, modifications, they need to be made to the environment, the individual's position within it, and then the, to the delivery of information. And this is to provide them with the same level of access to non-distorted information equal to their peers. So that's where that total communication approach comes into play. The way that our assessment process works, so we do, we start with a functional deafblind assessment where we receive the referral, we make sure you guys, the um, student meet medical criteria, uh, but then when we go out to assess, we're really looking at that functioning aspect. Like Beth said, what they see in an optometrist office or an audiologist office, like that, those are best case scenarios usually. Um, whereas a classroom, it's it's so different. There, there's so much more uh, of those compounding variables that we have to take into consideration. So uh, I do all of the functional deafblind assessments and I go out with a colleague. Uh, and what we're really looking for is this. The functional use of vision and hearing to, is assessed through observations, direct interactions, that are intended to elicit the visual and auditory abilities of the students. So how are they using their vision? How are they using their hearing? Are they able to integrate their senses? That's a big thing that we look for. So we take all of that information to decide whether the individual is deafblind or not. And then we actually present the student to uh, our administrative team. So that includes Dan Majacomo and uh, our principal, Lynn Osasui, uh, vice principal, sorry, uh, Lynn Osasui. Uh, and we determine what we're determining is are you functioning deafblind and would you benefit from our services? So if the student is deafblind, then ongoing support is provided in their educational placement by a, an educational consultant. So as I said, we have six consultants. We, again, deliver ongoing support uh, within the setting. And we, as I said, the frequency of con consultation is always reviewed. So uh, our preschoolers, they might get a little bit more support than students in school. Uh, depending on the type of support staff we have, there are more that hire interveners if, who are specially trained in deafblind strategies and techniques. So if a, if a student has an intervener, then maybe we don't provide as much support. So we kind of look at like what, what is the appropriate level of support? We collaborate with paraprofessionals. So OT, like occupational therapists, uh, physiotherapists, speech and language, um, and any agency that's interesting. We love collaborating because it's so important for anyone working with the student to know how to work with someone that's deafblind. 
uh, and we teach them, we model for them these um, the strategies uh, and techniques. We support families by offering information about deafblindness, intervention techniques, and other relevant resources. Uh, we will sometimes do workshops for families. We used to be more involved with families, but as uh, the years have gone on, we've been more focusing on the educational side of it, but we definitely are still available um, to support families and answer questions. We do professional oper uh, professional development opportunities through interactive workshops uh, that really focus on deaf blindness. And it's one of the most fun things to do. The interactive part <laughs> is usually some kind of simulation where we put uh, people, we help them to experience what it's like to be deaf blind and put them through some kind of situation um, so that they can really understand, oh, wow, like, this is huge when I, I have vision loss and hearing loss. Um, we we also, so after every visit that we would do with a student, we write uh, reports that have recommendations and strategies for programming. And that's all based off of what we would have observed during our visits. Uh, we provide clarification for vision reports and audiograms so that because sometimes we get these reports or schools get these reports and they don't know what the vision condition is or what the implications of it is in the educational setting. So that part of our job is to um, educate schools and support staff on what vision and hearing is and what kind of strategies need to be used. Um, we attend uh, key meetings, case case conferences uh, upon request. And then we do also support um, transitions for students. And that, as Beth said, that can be into school, into high school, to adult services. Uh, we make sure that like funding is, uh, information is provided to the families uh, because there is specialized uh, funding for uh, individuals who are deaf blind. So just before we open the field to some questions, I just, as I was listening to Amanda, um, I'm recognizing it is very confusing to sort of understand the difference between our services and a couple of key points. So Amanda's service, because they work for, with and like from birth all the way to 21. And just to explain for our services for blind and low vision, there are those early childhood vision consultants who are through that other ministry who provide those services for babies who are blind and low vision. So if you know of families who have babies who are blind and low vision, they should be contacting um, an early childhood vision consultant. And then we would only get involved at age two for those little people who are potential braille users. And otherwise we wouldn't really be involved until transition to school time. That's for all children, whether they're potential Braille users or not, we would help with that transition to school. So I just wanted to explain why we're not also from zero to 21. Um, that's because there is another ministry service that provides that. And then um, within district school boards, there are a lot of vision teachers. So we're, my department is supporting those vision teachers in the kinds of um, supports that they're going to provide to those students in the board where there are not very many deaf blind teachers in the in the school boards so amanda service is more of an ongoing uh working one-to-one -one with the students where ours is definitely more we do meet one-to-one -to, -one to do our assessments but we're more consultative to help support the staff who are working with those students which includes vision teachers and educational assistance. So I we recognize it's a little bit confusing, although they're similar, there are some very distinct differences between um, the two resource services programs. So now we're going to open up the floor to questions. You can ask questions about the school services that we covered at the very beginning that Dan would have been happy to share if he'd been here, and then um, anything about vision resource or anything about deafblind resource. One quick thing that I'll clarify before you do, all referrals for vision resource services have to come from the school. These are not referrals that come from parents. Parents can advocate for sure to have a school put those referrals in, but our referrals do have to come um, from the school, either a principal, a vision teacher, a resource teacher. Um, that, and, and the biggest component of that is that we need some sort of medical 
uh, information to support that the child has uh, blindness or low vision. And Amanda, for your referral process, I would say it's pretty much the same. Like it would come from someone in a school for the babies and like preschoolers. Usually, the it would be the early childhood or early childhood vision consultant, um, or maybe even someone from preschool home visiting, uh, which uh, Christy and Amy would have talked about at the previous. Uh, session for resource services. Um, that's, I would say, where it normally comes. I don't think a parent's ever done it on their own. Right. Mm -hmm. And like I said, sometimes parents might know about the service before a school. And so they're certainly encouraged to advocate for the school to put that referral in. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly why we like to do these kinds of sessions so that you know that the services are available um, because it is a bit of a maze to find everything online and so much easier if you've got some personal contacts that you can always reach out to ask questions. So feel free to like unmute yourself and ask a question or if you feel more comfortable putting it in the chat. We've got uh, eight minutes before we've got um, to wrap up. Oh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I was told that um, we have one student who is like 100% blind. Right now he's in grade eight, but I don't know where I heard this from or if it, I heard it from the parents or it was uh, through the referral, but a student that goes to W. Ross McDonald, they said it has to be pretty self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this student right now, I mean, right now I, his teacher comes out, his itinerant teacher, comes out to meet him at the van. They bring him out when he's done at the end of the day. So he's not that independent to say, walk into the school and walk to his classroom. His teacher comes out and gets him like every day uh, in the morning and then brings him back out at night. So does that, like, how would that look at W. Ross McDonald? Yeah, that's a really good question. When you say itinerant teacher, is that an itinerant teacher of for vision? Coming, yes. And, and yes. there are they coming from another district school board? Like uh, the services are coming from a district school board? The services are coming from a district school board. And I think he spends like I think he spends two hours in the afternoon uh, with her. And then okay. he's got his his uh, his specialized classroom teacher that he's in uh in the morning. Right. Okay. And I'm sorry, you went out there just a little bit. So you said they come in the afternoon to work with him and they are, are they a vision teacher? Yes, they are. Okay. So yeah, he spends two hours uh, in the after each afternoon with him, with her. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So a couple of things. Um, one, I would highly recommend if the student hasn't been seen by vision resource services before that you put, he had, he's had many referrals and, and they've come up to, uh, to do the assessments on him. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, and have they, um, have they contacted the school in terms of like even asking questions about admissions process? When you say who, who's, when you say they, the, the school, the school it's, or the parent, the parent could have also reached out. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like, yeah. The parent is, is quite aware. Yeah. Cause they're, they sign off on the referral. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so we, we were it, going to have a referral done, but it was suggested by the itinerant teacher that we wait till he gets into high school because his, his supports are going to look so different once he gets to high school as opposed to now. Yeah, that's a very good point. Serve, like in terms of the level of support can really change when students right. transition. And that is a really good time actually to have us involved as well to help with that transition and and kind of gives us a baseline before they're going in to high school um, right. in terms of what it would look like at W Ross for all admissions um, you know we defer to that admissions coordinator and the parent or the school could contact the admissions coordinator to ask about you know if they're wishing to have a tour if they're wishing to come visit the school if they're thinking about admissions at all um, generally, the school will want to obviously understand the needs of that student and make sure that they're able to provide supports mm. for that student. So like you said, if they have very, very high needs for which they they need one-to-one -one support, let's say, 
Um, that is not something that we can provide here at W. Ross. We don't okay. provide one-to-one -one support. So they would be in a very small class, potentially, you know, three or four students in a class. Um, but if they're a student who requires that kind of EA support all day long, one-to-one, -one, that would not be a situation that um, that the school would be able to support. Mm. So, and I, but, do, I do believe the parents have taken a tour of of okay. uh, W. Ross McDonald, yeah. So right, right. So I'm sure that was probably communicated to them. Um, and like I said, we have to make sure that the student will benefit from the programs. We also have to make sure that the student can be here safely. So there's right. so many factors that come into play. There's health, you know, medical factors that come into play, behavioral factors that come into play, the the need for level of support, all of those things come into play mm -hmm. when we're looking at admissions and that's why every situation is individual which I personally think is a very good thing we don't just mm -hmm. have this is the criteria and you're either in or you're out it doesn't right, work like yeah. that um, every situation is looked at individually so definitely you know encourage them if they're still having questions about it to contact that admissions coordinator also I'm always happy to you know facilitate that for you if, if you want to reach out perfect thank you very much Beth, could I make a comment too? Um, so you uh, you were just mentioning that you weren't putting in a referral until next year. Um, and I'm just wondering, Beth, if you could talk about how like it's better to it maybe put it in now and it can be rolled over to next year. That way they can be seen earlier than potentially later. Yes, very good point. We do ask people to put referrals in as soon as possible because there is often a little bit of a wait. Um, just as an example, we've just this week started rolling over, as Amanda said, putting referrals that are coming in from now until the end of the year, we will be seeing in September. We may see a few of them because of cancellations, but if you want a student to be seen in the fall next year, put a referral in right now, and the chances are great that they will be seen in, you know, very early on in, in uh, next school year. I believe we submitted our referral in January. Okay. So you think there's, and and the student hasn't been seen yet? He's been seen many times throughout the year. Okay. Yeah, like okay. His, his last his last formal assessment was done, I think about a year and a half ago. Okay. So it was said like his, his, his outcome would, wouldn't probably change too much. It's where, it's where we want him uh, assessed in his new environment at high school. Right. So, yeah, okay. so we had submitted that in January already. And I just want to make sure that you've had follow through because if something came in in January, it you should have heard something by now. Okay, well, probably maybe the parents have. I haven't. Okay. Do yeah. you want to just do you mind just emailing me so that you and I connect so that we can follow up on this? Okay. So I, you know, it's a very very unique situation. It's something that I've got to go through our manager about to see if. Because everything had to be approved by the parents. Sure. So I'm not sure. Like, I don't, I don't even know if it was sent back to the school for the school to forward it or not. So yeah, I understand if that. maybe get to the get to the person who put the referral in and have them reach out just to make sure right. that that we um, are all on the same page. OK, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. You're all welcome. right. All right, that uh, thank you for those amazing, you know, uh, opportunities for uh, the question period. Amanda, Beth, what a an amazing, you know, uh, presentation. And I think what we need to do is, you know, um, have some more information out there available for our uh, First Nation schools and and their learners. Uh, we have uh, our gifted uh, children. It's a uh, seasonal uh, newsletter, and I think will be able to make some room for, you know, your organization to create some literature for our First Nations and uh, to access. And I think it's very important to get the the information about uh, uh, W. Ross McDonald School, the uh, vision uh, resources services that you offer and the deafblind resources services and it's, it's very important to get the information out. Maybe what we'll do also is we'll all, you know, Amanda, you were mentioning some workshops and stuff. And I think that, you know, let's do this. Let's get some families and see if we can get, um, you know, the, 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 the family component in there because it's, you know, 
very often that we need to get these these partnerships, you know, together so that our families and the learners are more comfortable. And I think that is, you know, a huge area that needs some concern. So again, it brings us to 1230 and I don't know if Zoom will just cut us off. But thank you. The information presentation, if you can send us the presentation and somehow we can create a link to have the presentation available because there were some questions uh, in reference to accessing the presentation. Absolutely. And Patricia, if you want Amanda and I to provide you anything in writing to put in a newsletter, let us know and we can help you to provide that. Absolutely. I'll send an invite for our, our newsletter uh, very, very shortly. Um, again, Christy, Amy, thank you very much. Um, I look forward to creating other ventures for our Lunch and Learns. Just, just a truly honorable experience. All right. Thank you, everybody. You have a wonderful day. And I look forward to seeing everyone again. Jamiigwech for today. Thanks, Patricia. Bye-bye. Take care.